Dr. Logan wants to talk about his naps now. Different in the afternoon. And it could be anywhere from. Yeah, yeah, sorry. I, I just I had to do something on the back end. Yeah. Oh, I just I just met with this I guess so you say so. Somewhat irrelevant. Uh, yes, yes. Okay. Uh, okay. 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 I think I'm sure here. Why not? So <laughs> okay. All right. Well, let's get started. Um, thank you, everyone, for coming to our first uh, soil health conversation for the semester. Uh, so this is sponsored by the Washington Soil Health Initiative uh, that Chris Benedict over at Whatcom County is uh, leading. And the goal of this series is to bring together the community, uh, people from various uh, subdisciplines that have interest in soil health to engage with distinguished speakers that we have the privilege of having visit us um, and as well as uh, WSU eminent scientists uh, in a sort of structured discussion format. So I have a list of prepared questions that I will pose to um, our two people in the hot seat. Um, and yeah, if anyone in the audience has you know, follow up uh, things that emerge during the discussion, please jump in. Uh, I'll try to make a point of repeating those questions for the people at the outlying stations. Um, and without further ado, um, we will get started. So maybe I will start with Dr. Lal. So the first question is, uh, what is your personal definition of soil health? <laughs> Thank you. Um, I normally define um, a soil health is not a destination, but it's a journey. And what I mean by that is the definition depends on what are the objectives uh, of managing soil health, and that objectives keeps on changing with every generation, if not sooner. Uh, in fact, I always begin with an example of uh, Moses uh, giving his uh, guidance to the disciples who are entering Canaan and telling them uh, when you visit there, you know what Canaan is. Uh, and it's in Bible, Numbers 1. So um, tell me what the land is like. Uh, does it have tree or no tree? Uh, how do people like? Are there few or many? Uh, what are the fruit growing there? Do your best to bring me some fruits of the land. So in that paragraph, tell me what the land is like, are the trees on it or not, 
agar people many are smart is essentially defining the ecosystem services that soil health generates so from that time onward uh, every generation had their own aspiration and own goals and they have to define their own criteria and the definition so i think this is why i would rather say it's a journey rather than a definition and what we define today probably 10 years from now may not be valid i want to give you example duran and jais in 2000 and results and so on <laughs> did define soil health they said it was a soil as a living body uh, to manage uh, many ecosystem services and one ecosystem services that got left out critically was climate change adaptation mitigation in 97 when that was published that was not an issue so when i defined 2016 soil health i took all the other things that the ran and group decided and added also mitigation and adaptation of climate change mm-hmm. and filtration of water to improve the water quality and so i think the it is a time dependent definition so right now so our health then is a living uh, realm uh, managed through organic matter content and its uh, properties to create ecosystem services such as food security nutrition security water quality and renewability and adaptation mitigation climate change through management of soil biota and couple cycling of carbon water nitrogen and element mm-hmm. yeah but 10 years from now it might change yeah yeah no it's really fascinating to think about yeah the different time scales yeah. of these things um yeah how about you do well, what's your personal definition, definition. So and you know i guess rather than kind of reiterate definition i i think it's a a concept that's really pretty brilliant from the perspective of connecting with more of the public from a social perspective and you know when public hears about soil quality it's it's kind of this scientific assessment of you know the suitability of the capacity of soils to you know deliver various kinds of of ecosystem services but at the same time when you add the health component to it you bring in the fact that soils are alive and have a, a real you know biological kind of of dimension that's crucial to us as human beings and i think many people can relate to that much more so and so quality so it's really in the fact that you know much of the challenge of conveying our science to the public is having that connection to the public in ways that are meaningful for them and so our terminology needs to be able to to really be captivating you know from their perspective so that so that soil health i mean everybody can start to resonate with that even drew lion you know so <laughs> to a certain extent maybe <laughs> maybe I'll stretch sorry drew but still that is something that that i think that is a, a a kind of a concept that the NRCS kind of pushed i thought their whole advertisement you know with soils as a living body really really got the message out to the public in a broader sense and i think that is critical for us now you know there's a, a really a, a paradox <coughs> that exists right now you know we probably know more about soil than we ever have had in the history of of human civilization at the same time uh, so degradation processes are also <laughs> almost at a at a high peak so that's to me is very disturbing and so what's the disconnect it's not so much you know our science as the way that we you know it's more than communication it's just our culture and the way we use resources and how can we start to to put a much more human spin on this from the standpoint of really reengaging the fact that 95% of the food that they eat comes from you know the soil that a quarter of the world's you know biodiversity comes from soil that soil has this tremendous function from the standpoint of being capable of mitigating that some of our climate change issues so meeting some of these you know literally world world scale kinds of of uh, of uh, challenges that we have really 
needs to, you know, and, and has to um, uh, integrate soil and soil science in ways that are powerful. But it's complex, you know, so, so soil health, you know, tries to deal with the complexity, you know, soils, abiotic and biotic factors, you know, solids, liquids, gases, <laughs> all interacting in combination to have these aversion properties that are that are difficult to follow. And when you compare that to, say, water quality or air quality, soils are, I would say, much more complicated in terms of trying to understand them. And that complexity is a real challenge for us in terms of delivering, you know, succinct messages to the public in terms of how their choices are really impacting soil health. And I think as we move forward with trying to, to look at ecosystem services and try to have you know, value for those services that is you know, translated to farmers to, the, to their benefit. And we'll really have to have this soil health concept there in terms of getting you know, much broader you know, expectations for, for agriculture that we have now to meet some of those, not just the provisioning services, but the regulating and environmental social services. So you could ask, what's the social? You know, what are social indicators of soil health? You know, are those you know you know nutritional? Are they you know uh, our society in terms of how they actually perceive soil, et cetera? Mm -hmm. And you know, you look around here, we have you know erosion events that are that are that are happening that you know color our waters here. They're brown. People are almost used to that type of symptomology that occurs here, and yet. You know, you won't read anything about that in our local papers, and maybe that's our fault. <laughs> in terms of, hey, look what's happening around you. The observations that are, are there that are in, are symptomatic of, of issues that we have here that are very, you know, degradational in terms of our, our soils. And why isn't that being communicated in a very explicit way to people around us? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So some of that comes back on us <laughs> in terms of how we communicate. But I think soil health is a kind of a vehicle to do that with because I think it, it does really hit people mm -hmm. because they know about their own. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and it's interesting, you know, because, so Mary, oh yeah, uh, go might check in with the off campus folks to see if they're agree. Both speakers are kind of quiet. Oh, okay. okay. Um people off campus? Okay, thumbs up. Awesome. Okay. Okay, great. <laughs> <laughs> um yeah, yeah. So the it sounds like you know like both um, both of these definitions you know sort of converge on you know kind of this this idea of of soil as a as an entity, um, which I think echoes a really fascinating idea that you brought up in your seminar yesterday of soil rights. Um, and yeah, I wonder if you could maybe yeah. connect those yeah. two <laughs> concepts. Well, um, it goes back to Charles Keller, uh, who was again USDA. Uh, when he said soil and life have evolved together, um, the soil depends on life and life depends on soil. Uh, and therefore, soil, as uh, David said, is a very large reservoir of biological diversity. So it's a living thing. Um, soil respiration uh, is an indication of soil health. Just like we respire when you, know, you go to take your medical test, doctor put you on a treadmill and see how much CO2 you are respiring. And the same thing, soil respiration quotient is an indication of soil health because it's a living entity. So then the question comes in, if soil is a living entity, and if all the life, or at least the terrestrial life, depends on the soil health, then we have a concept here, uh, just like any other living entity, animal, uh, have a right. Uh, to survive, uh, why shouldn't soil have those legal rights to survive? Mm -hmm. And uh, that comes to the idea of soil protection policy, that we should have a policy of protecting soil. And if I were to in develop a program of protecting soil, let's say the US, uh, we have three options. One is the spiritual option, you know, like we're talking Bible, Quran, uh, Hindu Vedas, uh, Buddhist scriptures, uh, they all really preach that soil, Latin word, terra, 
Sanskrit word dhara, similar to Latin, uh, put soil uh, as a five, one of the five elements from which human body is derived. Therefore, if you damage, desecrate one of those five elements, uh, the human uh, health is also depleted, degraded, jeopardized. So that means protecting soil through spiritual means. How about asking the Christian in church, uh, the Islamic, the Hinduism, Buddhism, all those religions, Sikhism. Uh, by the way, I don't know if anybody is uh, sick from uh, Punjabi. Uh, they have in their scripture a very beautiful link, and I'll repeat that and then I'll explain you its meaning. The Paun Guru, you understand Guru, Pani Pita, Mata, Dharp Mahat. Water is father, and the water is the teacher. I'm sorry, take it back. Pound Guru. Wind is the teacher, air. Uh, water is the father, and the greatest of them is the mother earth. In one scripture, one phrase, it links those three things together. So, going back to these religious organizations, say, and all of them, by the way, the dust I see is Quran. Uh, human are made from clay. Uh, wouldn't be any better soil so made. From water we drive everything. Do not waste water, that Prophet Muhammad, even if you live on a river. But it couldn't be said any any better than so it doesn't matter what religion they all worship, preach. So that's one possibility. Other possibility is uh, uh, funding, money. Uh, like I was talking about payment for ecosystem services. If you do this thing uh, we, the society, will remunerate you, uh, reward you X amount of dollar per acre per year. And not subsidy, it's ecosystem subsidy. The third possibility is legal means. Soil, being a living entity, has a right to be protected, managed properly, judiciously in time. Uh, it cannot be treated uh, just as the owner wishes to treat, like a vicious slave girl. No, uh, it must be protected. So those are the third, uh, three options. So the third option, <clears throat> Europe had an act called part of the European Parliament, 29 countries, now I think 28, uh, if Brexit uh, is implemented, um, on soil protection. And in 2007, I took their writing and wrote it up for the U.S. Senate to approve. And the U.S. Senate did approve it. So there is a soil protection resolution approved by U.S. Senate. The one part which got missing was in that legal part that's similar to Clean Air Act and Clean Water Act, the Healthy Soil Act is not there. And that part I was hoping and the Soil Science Society of America will take it and go to the Senate for approval and then eventually to EPA. And the European Parliament will take it and implement it for 28 European countries. It happened in the world. But that is the idea about the legal part. Um, Lake Erie's legal right was approved last January by Toledo because of the Elgar Blue problem. You cannot pollute Lake Erie as you wish. Of all the places, Ganges, you know, which is the most polluted sacred river, the, the state from where the Ganges originated has now approved the law. Ganges has a right to be protected. Mm -hmm. Which means Ganges is not going to get up and say, don't do it. We, the human, who are the custodian, trustees, have to say, no, you cannot pollute soil or water or Mount Everest or Himalaya or whatever, <clears throat> or the Amazon forest. I think that has to come. Otherwise, the, the, the way the population is expanding and uh, you can do whatever you want to do with water and wind and air and uh, mountains and uh, vegetation, uh, it will uh, lead to nowhere. So I think eventually the best thing to do is combine all those three options. Uh, but legal is the one which is not going to be very easy. People are going to say, this is my land, what do you mean? But it is something that has to happen. Yeah, yeah Bill. Uh, one question, Ritan. Um, so, uh, 
thinking in terms of uh, animal protection, we think we would uh, try to develop the concept of endangered soil series. <laughs> yes, very good. Excellent question. Yeah. Yeah. So for extinct, that, for extinct people... soil series first. Extinct. Yeah. Have like species have gone extinct. Right. Have soils are gone? You bet, soils have gone extinct. Mm -hmm. When the top soil by which we define their classifications, when that horizon is gone, the soil lost its identity. There are many extinct soils, and there are many endangered soil, mm -hmm. peat soil that we are cultivating throughout the United States. Every time we cultivate, we lose an inch. Every time we plow. I was working in Ohio in the Lake Erie. Soils are four feet deep peat. You're losing one to two inch a year. In 24 years, they are gone. They are endangered soil. So we have to, just like panda and the monarch butterfly and uh, bald eagle and other things have been endangered species and we have protected them, that kind of, we have to do the same thing. So, absolutely. Um, okay, so the next question is, how has our understanding of soil health changed over the course of your career? <laughs> <laughs> or do you want to... Oh. Well, over the course of my career, let's see. <laughs> well, I, I think, you know, I first was more directly engaged with the concepts of soil health back when it was called soil quality. So this was back in the late 80s and early 90s. And and kind of referred to that with some of the work of John Duran and others and, and and Bill Larson and Fran Pierce and others that that kind of came up with concepts of soil quality and defined minimum data sets etc and there was quite a discussion at the time of the term soil quality because previous to that uh, you know soil science had taken what might be called a a value neutral kind of stance at defining soil where you know we were looking at capacities or suitabilities for various kinds of purposes and and there were strengths and limitations in terms of what soils could do well the soil quality concept started to have conversations where some people uh, thought we were starting to get more value laden in terms of oh there's a a politically correct way to basically manage your your soil and this is the quality piece of it and and that got into kind of the sociological uh, uh, kinds of perspectives in terms of how we define soil quality so there's quite a bit of discussion at the time was it Soki Soika then down in uh, and uh, USDA I think and then others you know we're we're kind of having heated battles in the literature in terms of, of this definition. And then, you know, you have, I think, you know, the whole concept of soil quality, I have been disappointed in it because um, I think much of the challenge is kind of dealing with the fact that every location is unique, brings, you know, a legacy with it in terms of what has occurred on that soil and in turn, then that influences, you know, how management options are going to interact with that in ways that are, are very unique and deliver various kinds of outcomes in terms of how crops perform and how that ecosystem performs in terms of delivering various ecosystem services. So grappling with that uniqueness then is where trying to define a minimum data set or a specific suite of indicators that are universal has been really difficult. And I have railed against that personally <laughs> in terms of, okay, we really need to be more diagnostic in terms of the situations that are, that are out there. That's what we're given. And that, yes, we can draw from, you know, what we know, you know, in terms of the various kinds of, of measurements to be diagnostic of the particular issues that we're dealing with you know, because of the complexities that are out there. So how do we come up with, with better diagnostics and better ways to, to basically um, um, chart <laughs> the dynamics of some of this? Because much of that soil quality uh, word came out of the fact that we're trying to deal with a lot of dynamic properties and how do we, 
how do we do that in terms of, of quantifying some of that dynamic? And how do we look at that over time so that we can see you know, the direction towards various kinds of perhaps thresholds where, where we are basically you know, being destructive in terms of that resource? And so you can think about uh, so quality along those lines and that and discussions amongst minimum data sets. But I, I think many farmers kind of, yes, <laughs> we can get excited about that. But some of these data, you know, ways of measuring things really don't pertain to me. So you can start a conversation about soil quality and here's the data you should be trying to measure it. But that might end the conversation if those measures aren't very useful to them to make decisions with. So it has to be really relevant to the farmer uh, or the producer at hand. So, so, and then the concept of soil health came in and here I think this kind of went beyond uh, quality in terms of emphasizing biological nature, the fact that soils are alive and bringing in, you know, that dimension from the standpoint of, of, um, of understanding our soils. And, you know, uh, along with that came, you know, very powerful technological advances in terms of how to measure some of those kinds of, of, um, of properties. And so I, I think that has, it's kind of the, the biologist's turn in some ways to try to integrate their science into soils as a whole. And I think some of their challenges are really an integration process. How do we look at soils, which are outcomes of these various physical, biological, and, and uh, chemical properties, and an emergent property that actually is beyond all those characteristics to in terms of ex expressing itself? How do we integrate these new scientific advances into that concept to really deliver, you know, measurements of, of not just the threats to soil in terms of degradation, but also the various functions that we have from decomposition regimes to nutrient cycling to, you know, buffering, et cetera, to then delivery of ecosystem services in terms of everything from climate change on out to food and everything else. So where do you take that technology integrating it into that type of, of of the landscape to kind of deliver then meaningful kinds of information to the land managers that they can use effectively to manage. And, you know, quite frankly, you need some real good quantification of various kinds of, of indicators of soil in order to be, you know, evidence-based in terms of, of of how you're assessing whether or not you're achieving certain kinds of outcomes of whatever practice that you have out there. So it's really needs to be relying on our science. And so, you know, where, how is that? So as a soil scientist, you're thinking, okay, how can you deliver from the standpoint of framing up various kinds of indicators to uh, say, okay, and soil health provides a yardstick for that. We should be somewhere here <laughs> in terms of being able to, to deliver various kinds of uh, uh, functions and ecosystem and services associated with that. So, so those kinds of frameworks, I think, are, are complicated. They tend to be bigger picture <laughs> in terms of, of how they're written about, but really need to be you know, quite specific when it comes to a particular soil or a particular use of that soil. And in the end, in terms of the concept of soil quality and soil health, um, you know, you can quote Wendell Berry, you know, what we do to the land, we do to ourselves. I mean, ultimately, this all reflects back on us and vice versa, and it's symptomatic of our civilizations. So. Yeah. So how about over, over your um, I'll say, uh, pick up there, uh, Dave, that from, uh, we need to quantify uh, soil health so we can uh, give it a quantitative, credible, repeatable uh, numbers that this is what soil health means. Uh, when we go to see doctors, they have 98 temperature and so much pulse rate and so much blood pressure. Uh, are the critical factors and they have critical limits beyond which you say, oh, you've got some problem. I think soil health, we have to identify key parameters equivalent to blood pressure, pulse rate, uh, calcium content of the blood or whatever. 
and uh, indication. But one step more we have to go, and that is indicator of soil health that scientists can quantify, but farmers can relate to, and policymakers can understand and appreciate. And that part we quantify, but farmers relate to, and policymakers can understand what it means is the key link mm -hmm. that we really have to evolve mm -hmm. in our to address the issues we are facing right now. Mm -hmm. And so do we have some of these? We do, do not. Do you think? Okay. See, that's what mm -hmm. we, we were discussing, Bill, that what Salt and Society of America mm -hmm. or our USS or working group could do. That working group will do quantification of the parameter, identification and quantification how to monitor them, <laughs> how to predict them, how to evaluate them. For the other part, how can farmers relate to them mm -hmm. and how can policymakers understand and appreciate them so they can help us implement the program. To do that, those parts cannot be left out into that process. And without that, the progress that we can make Will not happen. Without that, the issue of food security and nutritional security that we think is, is important part, climate change adaptation and mitigation, which we think is important part, water quality and renewability, the biodiversity. So scientific community somehow has to communicate effectively with farmers on the one side and general public as represented by the policy makers on the other side. Mm -hmm. So it's a triangle, it's a three-legged stool that we really have to have to think about. Or maybe you want to go uh, into a different uh, model, uh, the driveway model, perhaps a, a pyramid model, where you have a base of a pyramid is the soil health and the parameter that govern it such as soil organic carbon dynamics or soil water holding capacity. And the four sides of the pyramid might be the ecosystem services that we have been talking about all the way from Moses' time onward, food security, biodiversity, water quality, climate <coughs> chain mitigation. So let's say there's four sides of the pyramid, which are the ecosystem services that soil health management generates. But then the question arises, is this pyramid stable? And the stability of that pyramid depends on whether the four apex where they meet together and whether they stay glued together. And that they're gluing together, putting a ring around them so they do not fall apart is the policy and how the farmers interpret and understand. Mm. So when we scientific community develops that pyramid, here is the soil base, soil health, here are the ecosystem services, then we got to have the general public and policy and uh, community support it so that this pyramid doesn't fall apart. Mm -hmm. And that continuity, that nexus, interconnectivity is part that soil scientists have to understand to begin to think in that direction to make a progress. Yeah, I love that image. Um, yeah, okay, so shifting gears a little bit, um, what are some of the new tools and technologies that you're most excited about? You want to start? <laughs> <laughs> Tina, the good job. That I can, I can fill in the blank that you use. <laughs> no, thanks for that. <laughs> Not sure you'll be filling in blanks here. <laughs> a lot of blanks. <laughs> no, I, I think. But you're excited about yeah, like not, I, every single, excited not every single technology. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, when I think of trying to assess soil health, I like to think of, of technologies that are more integrative in nature that really capture some of the ways that, that outcomes of our tropic systems have integrated you know, many soil properties in order to have expressed a certain kind of performance. And so when you think about agriculture, 
in particular. Um, you can think that we have a lot of integrative measures already. So you can call yield a bioassay of our soil, right? Uh, and many other things that are integrated together. So, so yield is, is one and, and, you know, we have obviously combines that measure that, but I, I think as we, we need to, to add to that list <laughs> in terms of those integrated properties. So for instance, we can look at nitrogen use efficiencies, water use efficiencies, other things from the combine in terms of measures now or through remote sensing that reflects various kinds of of water or nutrient stresses that may be occurring across our, our landscape. So, you know, a lot of these technologies, I think, can be brought to bear to capture some of these bioassays that are being expressed every year in terms of our cropping systems that identify various kinds of, of issues or, or goodnesses that we have in our egg system. And I think, you know, that's exciting now. I think that's becoming very powerful in terms of interpretable, interpretable across you know fields and at scales that are relevant to, to farmers, uh, these kinds of outcomes of their farming system, and you know this has been really a weakness in a, from a farmer perspective in terms of their capacity to manage soil health because they don't have enough interpretable measures that they can really relate to in order to diagnose what's going on and to react to it. So many of them, okay, we come up with a prescription map, say, of nutrient application, nitrogen, for instance. Okay, the emphasis has been on generating the map, but at the same time, where's the evaluation piece? Where's the measure of efficiencies associated with the outcomes of that prescription that was just made? And I think, that technology has been slower to come on board in terms of giving farmers real tools that they can assess the outcomes. And, you know, Rattan mentioned yesterday, you know, in terms of what we're working with here in terms of looking at sustainability, efficiencies are one thing that we're going to have to, to really deal with, but we need measures of those. And I think some of the technologies now are more powerful from the standpoint of being able to address those. So that's kind of the, you know, the, the space view, <laughs> perhaps, of yeah. some of this, but then getting down into the soil, our, you know, Darren, of course, and I, you know, the capacities that we have now to look at the biology and, and much of that, you know, now I see as in the realm of characterization with difficulties to, to really interpret from the standpoint of function and ecosystem services. So I, but I think that's part of the science. And, and there I think it's really crucial at this stage of that science to link it to these other measures that we have that we're more familiar with and also to these outcomes that we're describing on a field scale in order to, to really see the value and also to help interpret and guide some of the advancement of that science and that technology. So I, I really think that's that's a there the biology piece is you know just exciting and I don't nothing about it. I just say, oh this is important. <laughs> you know and we should be doing more of this. <laughs> you know, that's not very helpful when it really comes down to specifics. But I at the same time what I what I can provide is, you know, a little passion, but also you know, what I can provide is, you know, here's a lot of other things that we're measuring now. Let's link these together yeah. to really understand what's going on in very, again, unique circumstances that we see in our, in our agriculture. Mm -hmm. It'd be nice to be able to monitor, you know, the soil biology from space, but I'm not sure we're there yet. I know. Yeah. <laughs> Dave does a good job. He doesn't leave many blanks. <laughs> um, I think, uh, you know, simple things that we used to do when at least I was studying soil in the 50s and 60s, uh, you do color of the soil using Munsell color chart which somehow you relate it to carbon content. Uh, you do pH, uh, you look at uh, uh, whether it's calcium or not in it, uh, using hydrochloric acid test, effervescent test. Uh, you'll feel texture by rubbing the soil. Mm -hmm. uh, you remember all those things that we used to do in the field. But now, you know, just think about going out in the field and for every grade of, let's say, 100 meter by 100 meter, digging the soil sample, preparing it, bringing it to the lab, drying it, seaming it, micro milling it for carbon concentration, uh, analyzing it in CN analyzer, 
or mass spectrometer. You know, the cost for sample that comes <laughs> out and the amount of the labor involved, uh, like $100 per sample, and uh, you had two, three technicians, and last year I had uh, a couple of young guys in their 20s, and they came back with bag problems because they, they had to dig, and then they told me, why can't you go and dig? <laughs> so, I think this is a time when we have to begin about remote sensing. What are the key land parameters that we can sense remotely from which we can predict uh, the soil health parameters uh, in relation and the plant growth parameter? Remember yesterday I was talking about uh, uh, plants emitting signal when they have some problems. And uh, now we have been talking about NRCS. So if I were to plan something and if I had the resources, and I do not, uh, and nobody wants to give me resources, they think, hey, guys, when are you retiring? So let's say that we have a transact from Alaska to Florida. And the other way, we have a transact from Maine to Bahia, uh, the, uh, California South, what do you call that, uh, southern part of California. Baja. Baja. And, uh, well, we can uh, extend that. And we, didn't, we can have a straight north to south, uh, east, west, uh, from Washington or New York to San Francisco, if you'd like to have that. And select biomes. We have several ecoregions or biomes USDA has come up with, uh, based on soil at the base. And on those ecoregions, you have organic farming, you have uh, small folder farms, you have a commercial green revolution type of modern technology, and you evaluate by satellite imagery uh, properties, and then you ground truth them by regular measurements, and develop soil health index so that we do not have to go and monitor every 50 feet out in the field develop a database and keep repeating it. If somebody asked me that the USDA has uh, resources, I would say give me $10 million a year for next 100 years or 10 years, 100 million would be good, good amount to start with. I would develop that as a systematic basis to develop a remote sensing monitoring technology validated against the ground truth related to ecosystem services such as productivity in relation to land use and management, water quality, erosion hazard, and so forth. So this is the direction in which we have to think big, plan big, and go in a bigger direction. Mm -hmm. And somebody, and I'm hoping USDA, because <laughs> they have the resources, with our partners. <laughs> they, they, they have to go and they're looking for ideas. Yeah. We may have these, but I like to select those biomes. Every five years, we should have a quality of soil or health of soil or those different land uses published on a five-year annual basis so that we know how land use over time changes and how the monitoring through satellite imagery can help. I started asking that kind of money, of course, when I tell them the price tag, everybody said, forget it. Um, and then the remote sensing, what is the minimum grid size? Uh, should it be four kilometer by four kilometer? Forget it. We have to come down to a smaller one. But soil scientists have to wake up and talk to the remote sensing people, look, this is what we are looking for. And we should do our homework. And this is, Bill, what I'm thinking about, Triple S say, doing a symposium where you talk about these ideas and before we go to Senate or Congress for what we want, we really should be thinking in those kind of things. Right now we go for $100,000, a small plot, another thing, but we got to go on a national basis or on a regional basis, North America, include Alaska, Canada, Mexico in it. 
was basically like taking neon but like putting it exactly. in space. But put it, but have soil or <laughs> neon yeah. did not have a soil yeah. component. Yeah. They, have a, they have a little bit of soil. Little bit. But, but know, they did know. all the error term attribute soil. Mm -hmm. That, you mm -hmm. know, from the using the flux tower, mm -hmm. if whatever is missing, oh, this must be soil. Mm -hmm. No, <laughs> it's a soil based. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. And I think that, that it takes money. Yeah. But that's the kind of thinking we have to go in that direction mm -hmm. to really come up with a, uh, a value. That way we can say, yes, U.S. is a scientific leader mm -hmm. in soil health management. Yeah, yeah, it's like the, Hu the Hubble telescope, yeah. but instead of looking out right. in space, we're looking back. <laughs> but <laughs> we, all, the, all the eco-regions of the world that you can think of, tundra, boreal, uh, desert, uh, tropical rainforest, do exist within United States and territories. We could be really modeling the world. There you go. <laughs> you you like do it. You like it. I'll write that grant. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. As soon as I finish the one that I'm working on right now. <laughs> it has to be somebody like you writing it. Hey, you have a stake at things. If somebody like me writes it, oh, forget it. What is he talking about? <laughs> yeah, well, I don't have the, the awards that you have. So. <laughs> we'll give you some more. <laughs> um, yeah. Okay. So. Oh, yeah. Eight no, minutes till the grants be launched. Right. Right. Yeah. Um, okay. So maybe I'll combine the last couple. Um, so I really want to know what each of you think we're not paying enough attention to in terms of soil health, um, because you know soil health has kind of exploded as a field, and you know a lot of people are talking about about it. But you know, like what what's being left out of that conversation is important. Yeah. I, um, Probably the most important conversation is probably around the dinner table <laughs> with farmers and other land managers and talking about how they're managing their soil and how and what's influencing the decisions that they're making with respect to, to managing farming, whatever that might be. And, and really that's where, you know, you can really gain some important insights in terms of what kinds of issues that they're contending with, but also, you know, the, the way that they're making decisions. So there's a pathway, you know, and I use the example of the prescription map. Okay, here, Barbara was showing you on, on a table, kitchen table. Here's a prescription map of how I'm going to apply nutrients. And uh, I said, well, how did you get that prescription map? Go, mm. Tell me, go through the steps mm. <laughs> of how that you arrived at this, you know, particular decision map. It's a decision map, right? What are, where I'm going to apply nitrogen in this case, and and so we went through it. And he said, "Well, I have all these yield maps, and this is the one I liked." <laughs> and 15 years, he took this one, and then he said, "Then I just looked at the, you know, the basically the probability function, and <laughs> okay, divided that up <laughs> in terms of, and came up with four classes." And I said, "Okay, well, that's interesting. Well, I I can, you know, identify." you know, multiple knowledge gaps, <laughs> you know, and how in turn I might help inform that decision making with science that I can start to deliver. So now I'll start thinking about that from a soil health perspective and diagnostics, you know, about <laughs> nutrient use efficiencies, where's the map of the outcome in terms of nutrient use efficiencies that were expressed across that field. And often you get here, you get huge ranges and nutrient use efficiency if you're using uniform applications of, of fertilizer. And so, you know, so so where's that map that show, oh my gosh, I had way too much on here. And oh my gosh, here's where I had too little on. And here's where, you know, I had a lot on, but it, it didn't really, you know, get reflected in the crop at all. So <laughs> something else is going on there. So, so, and those need to be interpretable kinds of map outcomes that reflect some of these integrated processes. Again, efficiencies are great to think about because there's lots of differences in efficiencies across our land. And if farmers have knowledge of those, that gets them thinking. They haven't had those maps before. I mean, intuitively, no, yes, it's variable out there, but here's a quantitative way that they can actually understand the variable results of their management decisions. And in turn, think about how that might get changed to really increase efficiencies in their case. And many of them 
you know, that's all they can manage is their, some of their variable cost <laughs> input. That's the fertile agrochemical input, seed inputs, et cetera. Those are things that are in their, you know, control from the standpoint of, of how they manage things. And those, that has a lot of implications. If they had those kinds of maps, I can't help but think they would increase efficiencies tremendously mm -hmm. in terms of mm -hmm. how they manage their fertilizers in this case, yeah. but other things as well. So, yeah, so, so where are those, hit, hit where are numbers. those, where are those maps <laughs> that show, you know, the outcomes of their, their farming systems? And that can, that idea can be from every kind of agriculture performance that you can think about from, so organic matter to, to, um, to erosion process, to, to acidification, to all kinds of things, to action, to things that we're doing. There's outcomes that occur across these fields that if they had maps of those, my gosh, there would be very powerful for them to be able to use that information to change their management and adjust to those systems and address those kinds of issues. Yeah. What about you? What are we, what are well, we talking about? I, I think I, I agree with everything. Uh, yeah. What you said, uh, fully supported. My only additional part is we are soil as we are now. We are focused on soil as a medium for crop growth. We are really focused on agriculture, and we have done a good job, and we can do better. All we have been discussing. For last time, one of our use of soil for agriculture. Right. Mm -hmm. Soil has many, many other uses. And if we in soil science ignore them, somebody else is going to do it for them. And then we will say, look what has happened. Of all the people, geographers, geologists, mm -hmm. they will take care of many of the things that we should be thinking about mm -hmm. medical uses. Uh, mm -hmm. health uses of soil. Mm -hmm. uh, soil as a uh, archive of planetary history, mm -hmm. soil as an archive of climate history, soil as an archive of uh, evolution of species, uh, soil as an archive of uh, medical uh, uses, uh, many, many others. Soil uh, in space, mm -hmm. uh, it's used. I think soil health concept need to be broadened for uses other than agriculture. Mm -hmm. And the parameter, the uh, critical limits, uh, the way you combine them, they will change. And I think it is time that soil science community begin to teach classes for uses other than agriculture. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's not that it's not important. If not, we soil science community, you know, last night you asked the question, it's all signs declining. Mm -hmm. Right. This is the cause of declining. Mm -hmm. We are wedded to Too agriculture. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And we are very narrow. And the basic scientist, you know, we are now nowhere in the, uh, <laughs> the member of the academy or in the list of uh, bigger awards that come. Because why? Because it's the ecology or it is the other sciences which are doing the same thing which we should be doing. We're not done. But we, we, are, we are kind of focused on uh, plowing for crop production, uh, water retention for crop growth, which are very important, absolutely important. There's no question about it. But there are other things as well. And that brings to the question, what are the alternative to grow food for soil, mm -hmm. soil-less agriculture? We should also do that mm -hmm. because soil is good for other things. Mm -hmm. And that part in soil health and its management should not be left out. Mm -hmm. It should be a very important chapter of that. We came, we diverted from geology to soil and became part of crop and agronomy. But I think we left something behind. Mm -hmm. And something behind one of the basic processes that govern the entire life system uh, of the earth. Mm -hmm. And we should go back to our roots. Mm -hmm. Continue doing agriculture, but not leave out our important part. Mm -hmm. That is where our importance mm -hmm. and our enrollment and our attracting the brightest and the uh, brilliant young people to solve science. <clears throat> Britain, a good, good example of that is wetland delineation. Yeah. Uh, it's a 
professional soul scientists who get nosed out by yeah. plant land biologists and mm -hmm. engineers. And we, we need to explore other options. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. So we, we need to circle back and do a better job of training. And we have to start thinking programs. absolutely climatology. Right. I mean, carbon right. is the largest reservoir. Mm -hmm. uh, and climatologists even don't think about us as working on climatology. Mm -hmm. Biodiversity. I attended a meeting on behalf of IUSS, uh, uh, the restoring biology, restoration of the extinct species. Soil was not even mentioned. Mm -hmm. How is it possible? Yeah. We keep back. We are holding ourselves, okay, I got to go produce food and plow and have a rotation and fertilizer and <laughs> time of planting and date of planting. <laughs> we forgot the bigger picture. Mm -hmm. yeah. And we can't afford. Yeah, so in our, in our last minute, so going even bigger, um, <laughs> so do you think we'll ever be able to create soil on Mars? I think soil is already there in, uh, in Mars. Uh, I think it's a question of if we go there, mm -hmm. how to manage it. And uh, the Mars atmosphere is very thin, the gravity is uh, very small, so a hypogravity condition, how are the soil processes, uh, water movement, nutrient transformation, nutrient diffusion to plant roots, all those things need to be studied. Mm -hmm. And that's again same, same question. Uh, under low gravity conditions, uh, how do a plant growth? And, and that is, we, we got to produce food, and over there, we got to recycle. Mm -hmm. uh, so all those things under studying, we have to have, I think there was a, in Arizona, there was this what called Bi biome. Bi right, the bi biosphere biome. too. Yeah. Yeah, but biosphere I don't too. think the gravity could be no. modified there. <laughs> and therefore, most of the water movement, water retention, root growth, mm -hmm. uh, those processes are not studied. They are waiting. Mm -hmm. And somebody will not wait. If we keep waiting, They'll get done, mm -hmm. but not by us. Yeah. Yeah. I guess another question is just whether or not we'll need soil on Mars. <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah. Do, we, do we need to start farming and, in space? You know, I, I, I was just reading, I think it was last week, somebody sent me a blog on, it was entitled uh, Farm Free Food. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and it was the concept that, well, in 10 years, we'll no longer really need farmers or the use of so, such extensive land in order to produce food because we can manufacture the large vats with a petri dish and, hamburger. And it's, it's, everything else. So, so you know, and that, that got me thinking, well, we're going to have to move forward with what you were just talking about, OK, mm -hmm. alternative uses mm -hmm. <laughs> of, of soil and terrestrial systems to deliver other kinds of ecosystem services sufficient to food mm -hmm. to some extent. It was Alex McBratney seminar. Will by end of the century, uh, will we be growing food? Ninety-five percent, like now, we are growing on on soil. Right. The answer to that really is no. So, given that, what does it look like <laughs> in the future? And I was struggling. It's a hard conversation to have with farmers. <laughs> One. But well, there will another. be farmers, but the definition of a farmer will be different. Be different. <laughs> Yeah. Great. Well, thank you oh, so much. Yeah. 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 Right. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Not, no, 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 What is your major subject? Uh, so I'm actually an evolutionary ecologist. Okay. Yeah. So faculty yeah. member in ecology. Mm -hmm. Oh, no, so I'm in, I'm in yeah. plant ecology and carbon soil sciences. So yeah. I use um, plant soil microbial yeah. interactions and yeah. uh, systems to try to understand evolutionary yeah. ecology. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks so much. Yeah. Yeah. That was yeah. fun. Yeah. 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 I didn't know I was thinking of plant. I didn't know No. I didn't know what <laughs> the same questions you asked last time. I should have known. Yeah, but there are yeah, I got some water in there, but I got yeah. some more. Okay. Well, I don't know yeah, why I want to work there. Yeah, so you have some stuff in there. We're just going to ask you. It came up at one of my there's this. You know, if we need to get together, I'm going to talk about it. Are you coming down? We'll see you later. Well, you got to meet with the grad students. Yeah, talk to the students. Yeah, we have.
I'm not sure what I can communicate here. So I'm still okay. swimming around there. I, I don't know if you've got a chance to look at any of the specifications. Yeah, I glanced through it. Okay. Um, right. Yeah, there's like there's a lot of stuff. So like one of the things, and I think I need to convene a separate. So I'm going to try and help people focus on. Which I think makes a nice kind of. And then he's got you. Uh, 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 no, I think that really the the spatial thing. Is, you know, either <laughs> yeah. 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 Yeah.